I can think of three specific moments when I should have died. My dad was, was born in Colorado and uh, he was an FBI agent. And his greatest expectation was that his oldest son, me, would, would go to South Bend and at, attend Notre Dame as well. I went to an all boys Catholic high school as a two year starter on the football team, but I really didn't think I could get in there academically and I knew I couldn't play for them. In the fall of 63, right after Kennedy's assassination, my father said to me, you should consider Notre Dame. And I said, Dad, I can't get in there. So he applied for me. And then what I think happened is that he must have called the admissions office every other week to say, I'm an alum. I contributed to the Alumni Association and my boss is J. Edgar Hoover. I want my son to go, go to Notre Dame. In this fall of 1964, I went off to South Bend. I wasn't a good student. I flunked out in uh, June of 1966 and came home to pretty angry and devastated parents for sure. And my father was angry beyond angry. The first thing he said when I walked in the kitchen, he had the letter in his hand and he said, God damn it, you're gonna get drafted now. That's what's gonna happen to you. You're gonna get drafted. You know, it was awful. It wasn't a happy time. And then in October, without telling a single person, I went down and saw a Marine Corps recruiter in New Haven, Connecticut. When I told him that I had signed up and was enlisted and I'm going, he said, you know, when you flunked out, this was, this was immaturity and this was foolishness and you were a young kid and I understand that, it does happen. He said, but this, and he pointed like that, this, and pointing at my contract, he said, this is spite. You're just doing this to spite us. And I just said, Dad, no, it's not spite. I, I gotta go, I, I need to go away. He said, I never thought I'd live to see the day when I would consider my oldest son to be an asshole. And on the word asshole, he really stopped talking to me. He never said, go start the car, pass me the mustard. He also never said, happy Thanksgiving. He never said, Merry Christmas. And he never said, Happy New Year. And in 4th or 5th of January, he had already gone to work, I hadn't talked to him, and uh, my mother was in the kitchen, and I said, Ma, they, the recruiter said that my graduation will be in, in March, right around St. Patrick's Day, 67. And she said, no, no, Dennis, no, no, no. The, the graduation we were gonna go to was the one in South Bend in 1968, but we're not going to any dumb graduation in South Carolina. That's how I went out the door. At the end of boot camp, I had made PFC. I knew I was gonna be a, a, on graduation, I had that. So I had, to, I had done really well there. Three days before graduation, we were sitting in a school circle around the drill instructor and he was reading the MOSs. And I wanted to hear 03. I mean, I didn't want to drive a truck. I didn't want to be a cook. I mean, I wanted to hear 03. That's all I wanted to hear. I knew 08, 08 was artillery. And to me, artillery was driving a truck full of shells you know, pulling a lanyard on a cannon and having a show go out, and I didn't want that either. And so in this school circle that night, when he got to me, he yelled my name and I jumped up and he said, oh eight, and I winced. And he said, what the fuck is wrong with you? What is wrong with you, Private? I said, sir, the Private was hoping to hear 03, sir. He said, well, it's 08, do you know what that is? And I said, the Private understands that it's artillery, sir. He said, yes, it is, you're 0849. You're gonna be a Ford Observer, you'll be dead before Christmas. Sit the goddamn hell down. This evening, I came here to speak to you about Vietnam. The military can no longer justify this war with a casualty count. More Marines are dying along the DMZ than enemy. 
This is a different kind of war. When we were getting ready to leave from Vietnam, we got to the terminal. This big Continental jet landed. The plane opened up the doors and the guys came down the steps. They looked terrible. The uniforms didn't fit and they had big dark shadows under their eyes. Looking at them like, man, what have we, we signed up for? And a couple hours later, we got on the plane. came out the door to this oppressive heat and these terrible smells and the humidity and it was staggering really. The term you kept hearing was, we're gonna go north, we're gonna go north. Eventually my name was called and I went with the group and they said, you'll be flying up to Dong Ha. And they said, you're only here for a day and you're going to Quezon. U.S. Marine Corps jets unleash a heavy bomb attack on Hill 861 near Quezon, South Vietnam. When I checked in with the CO or the first sergeant, he said to me, you're gonna get attached out to an infantry company. And it was real peaceful there. They had not taken a round of incoming since the summertime. The Hill fights were not a memory, but they were in the past, but they were famous in Marine Corps history. And the guy said, see that hill over there, that bump, that dirty bump of hill? I said, yeah, he said, that's Hill 861. And this is so historical. It's like Bunker Hill or Omaha Beach. To, I went and took a picture of it with my camera and I didn't realize then that on the day after Christmas in 67, I'd be on that hill and go through the seats there. Two days later, this lieutenant looked pretty beat up and came up to me and he, he said, I'm Lieutenant Holderness. I've been the FO. Here are the maps, here's the compass, here's some binoculars. And I said, I, do I hold these for the, the lieutenant? And he said, no, there's a shortage of line officers. You're the FO. In the Marine Corps FO team, there's an officer, there's an enlisted scout, and there's a radio operator who's also enlisted. My company commander had a staff meeting. So I walked in with my little Paris Island red notebook, and he looked up and he said, who the fuck are you? The gunny jumped up and said, this is PFC Mannion, sir. He's taking Lieutenant Holderness's job. He said, Jesus, I can't have a non-NCO at my staff meetings, make him a corporal. And the first sergeant jumped up and said, sir, he hasn't been a, he hasn't been a lance corporal yet. He said, first sergeant, it's 0930, promote him to Lance Corporal. When he comes back from noon chow, make him a corporal. And that's how I got to be a corporal. The number of operations pretty minor in the fall of 67. And, and in November, we were at Dong Ha, and uh, they told us that Kilo Company was going to go up Route 1 the next day and establish another fire base. The trucks were actually rolling up the road, and then a jeep went flying by and pulled in front of the first truck and stopped. And a major got out, and he said, you got to turn these trucks around, they're going to Quezon. So they turned all the trucks around, we went right to the airstrip at Dong Ha, got on choppers, and they flew us to Quezon. That was the buildup for what became the siege. We got there on the 12th. We started running patrols every day, but there was no gunfire. There was no fighting, absolutely none. And then Christmas came and went. And on the 26th, we saddled up and we walked at least a thousand meters off the flat ground and then worked our way up to 861. Elevation 16, we got one by machine gun dead. We ran patrols every day starting on the 27th of December. It was a long patrol and a short one, and the FO team went with the long patrol. On the 15th of January, they sealed up the gates. No more patrolling outside the hills. Five days later, it's the 20th. A couple of Marines spotted a couple NVA on the ridge line, 500 meters away from us. We called in a fire mission, adjusted twice, 12 rounds maybe, 105s. And then they organized a patrol. They got permission to go out. And I didn't have to go, but I wanted to go. I wanted to see where the rounds hit and what it might have done. I wore my Black Low Converse sneakers. 45 minutes later, we're up there. The elephant grass is all smashed down. There's blood trails, there's pools of blood. There were no bodies right there. They were drag marks going to the west. So we requested permission to go after them. And the radio operator, two seconds later, said, permission denied, turn around and come back. 
and the staff sergeant got on the horn and he said, there's blood stains here, request permission to pursue further. And Jasper got on the radio personally and said, turn your men around now and come back. Down at the combat base, somebody stood up outside the last strand of wire with a white rag in his hand. It was an NVA guy, he was an officer. And he said, tonight at midnight, 861 is gonna get attacked, and you on south is gonna get attacked in the combat base when the sun comes up. It started to get dark, and we were on 100% alert because the NVA were out there cutting the wire. You could hear them. You could hear the wire being cut. You'd hear, and then the wire would spring back. And they were giggling and laughing, and you couldn't see them in total darkness. And it was really eerie to listen to people cutting the wire because they know they're coming through that at some point. Just before midnight, we heard a noise, a voice coming up from the trench line. It was a Navy corpsman, Malcolm Mole. What are you doing up here? So I got to go to the bathroom. And at the same time that happened, we got a call on the landline from the captain that there were NVA spotted outside of the wire at the southern end of the hill, and he wanted us to go down there. By the time we got down there, we were just crossing the LZ when a green flare went up, and all of a sudden the entire northwest corner of the hill is being targeted. Malcolm Roll was actually on his way down from using the bathroom. He was halfway down the slope, and an RPG killed him instantly. I used to think about him for the longest time, still do, to be by himself with no one around, moving down the hill in the dark, picking his way down, and then thinking how scared he must have been, but hustling back down to be with his platoon when the, when the round came in. And he was, he, <coughs> He, because of his personality and the fact that he, we were friendly with him and he liked David and I, it, it really stung. It really did. I said to David, we've got to get back up. We need to get back up to the top. And we got near the CP bunker and it was already in shambles. I said, David, we can't go across the top of the hill. We need to go back down, get to the trench line, and we'll, we'll work our way up the western trench line. Meanwhile, you know, explosions and gunfire, and we're calling 105. We worked our way up the trench line, and at some point there was this huge explosion to our right and above us, almost green, and it was the 106 recoilless rifle position being blown up with all the ammunition stacked underneath it. You can't see anything, it's totally dark. Then we got to a machine gun bunker, and I yelled, where's your team, where are they? And he said, I don't know, they're gone. They ran, I mean, they left him. He said, well, what are you doing here, Dennis? And I said, well, we've got to get up further around the corner and be able to see. And he said, well, there's an NVA guy right in the trench line there. You're gonna to have to get by him, and he's still alive. I said to David, give me your 45 and I eased my body out of the back of that machine gun bunker and into the trench line like this, and I was feeling in the dark and scooting out further and further, and I got to a point where I felt his hair, and I pushed a little bit, and he started to bring his head up. He was lying face down, and I just took my hand away, and in the dark, I just fired. And we knew he was dead then. And then we worked our way to another bunker and we took over that where we could see the ridge line and call in fire and, and adjust fire. And so we were there for the rest of the night and it gradually eased off. And it's clear we weren't gonna be contested any further. And then got to be just about sunlight. And all of a sudden from the Southwest, you hear ba-boom, ba-boom. And it was the opening rounds of the artillery hitting the combat base and the rockets. And the guy was right. It was just after sunlight they were going to attack the base. But they had figured at that point they'd, they would have overrun both hills. And that didn't happen, obviously. When the sun came up, the combat base was now being shelled. We needed to get to the top of the hill, so we went back down the trench line, stepped right on the dead NVA soldier in the trench, and then worked our way to the landing zone and then went up the hill that way. We came around the corner and the gunnery sergeant, who I really liked, Melvin Romo, gunny Melvin Romo, he was laying on his back and I closed his eyes, used my thumbs and I closed his eyes for him. 
I mean, I literally cried for him and for all of us, really. Gunnery sergeants in the Marine Corps, their job is to kick people in the ass and do what the captain wants them to do. And to see him dead like that, I thought, Jesus, I mean, if a guy like this gets killed, we, we're all gonna get killed. He told a bunch of us at one point, five or six days before the siege, it's gonna get bad here. And we know it's gonna get bad. You need to look out for each other. You cannot be afraid. You need to act with courage, but make sure you trust the people to your right and to your left. He said, all of this is fate. Five days later, he's dead. Gunny Rimmel, God. They sent a patrol out the next morning, so it's the 22nd, and I went. They were only gonna go right outside the Triple Concertina to see if there were any dead that they could bring in. Somehow those guys got inside the wire in the first 10 minutes. When they withdrew, they dragged as many of their dead people away as they could. The people they couldn't drag away were the people who were on the hill, but just inside the wire, and people in the wire itself. There must have been 20 or 30 of them out there. Those guys rotted over the next week, just rotted terribly. When the wind was blowing towards us down in that end of the trench line where there are gas masks at times from the stench. And literally with my binoculars, you could see an arm inside the wire with just a skeleton where his hand used to be. The rats cleaned him out and the maggots cleaned him out. Life on the hill deteriorated into just living in the ground. All the digging we did on A61 was with entrenching tools. There was not one shovel on the hill. All the food and all the water had to come to A61 by helicopter. We didn't have our own water source. We were sometimes one canteen a day. We lived in the dirt. We slept on the pieces of cardboard that sea rations were wrapped up in. Your, your pants got so filthy dirty and crusted that they would rot off at the knees. The hooded sweatshirt my father sent me, the arms rotted off eventually. I took a field shower in Dong Ha just after Thanksgiving in, in 67 when we were going up, going up to Kantian, and I didn't wash until we got out of Quezon in April of 68. That's what life on the hill was like. So tell me about this map. Where, where, where did this map come from? As an FO, you have to have a map, be able to call in, get coordinates, and call in artillery. I got this one, and it's actually two maps that I taped together, because at the time, we didn't know which way we would be going. It soon became red from the dust. Every square that you see is a 1,000 meters. These are 1,000 meter grid squares. I look at this map sometime at night, and I think about all the stuff that happened in particular grid squares, not specifically, but I think people were there, they were trying to kill one another. At some point, I radioed the combat base, and I asked them for a pair of, an extra pair of binoculars for my radio operator. So when I radioed down, they said, we don't have any. So the next day, after the 21st, when we got over, partially overrun, I radioed down and said, my, my, my binoculars got blown up. And that afternoon, we had another pair of binoculars. These are the binoculars that I stole from the Marine Corps. Those are the original ones I was assigned to, and then those are the ones I reported as being broken. For the next couple of months, we had two sets of binoculars. They also brought us in a big set of binoculars from a Navy ship. I used to look at the hill 500 meters away from us. It was unbelievable to look through that and see the NVA over there digging and throwing dirt around and bringing stuff up on top of that ridge line. Quezon. In March, the siege by the enemy is still underway. But now the end is in sight. Two and a half months of shelling day and night. No hot chow, mud and grime, red dust. But now Marines are moving out into the hills looking for the enemy. On the 12th of April, they told us we were packing up, that we were leaving by helicopter, and we were going to go to 881 South. And no one knew really what we were going to do. So I remember getting off the helicopter, turning in the trench line, 
coming around the corner and there was what was human flesh all over the side walls of the trench line. It was, it was scary. And then we were told we were going to attack on Easter Sunday, 881 North. When the sun came up, they were already running airstrikes. They're firing artillery in, in grid squares. They're just moving a whole grid square ahead of us. I would say, okay, shift the box, and they would shift the guns to another 500 meters ahead. And they were firing directly over our heads as we moved up onto the top, because the NVA would really dug in up there. And all the artillery strikes and the airstrikes decimated them. We killed a bunch of people up there, but most of them had fled off their hill to the north. We hunkered down on 881 North, you know, broken trees and the gunpowder smell everywhere, blood everywhere, and we we waited. All three companies just waited. What are we gonna do now? And then the word came, you're going back to 881 South. So we attack it, we take it, and a couple hours later they say, okay, pack up, you're going back. <sighs> okay, what do we even go here for? The next morning on the 15th, helicopters are flying into 881 South, one after the other. They're picking up everybody in 326 up there, and they're flying back to the combat base because we're getting out. We're going to leave Quezon in a day. I had befriended a lieutenant, Benjamin Steve Fordham. He went to Baylor, so I talked Notre Dame football. He talked Texas football. We talked about books. We talked about girls. He was really a good guy. He'd come by sit and have supper with us. He really was a genuinely good officer. We're in the dirt next to one another as the helicopters are coming in and they're taking out first platoon, second platoon, then the CP group, and he's gonna be on the last helicopter. While we were laying next to one another in the dirt, two rounds hit some distance away. I said, I hope they're not adjusting those. And he said, if they're half as good as you, they won't hit shit. My helicopter's landing in the LZ, they're 46s, and as I start to get up, he squeezes my hand and he says, I'll see you at the base. Five minutes go by and the helicopter lands, the ramp goes down, and the Marines are carrying four people, five people. Lieutenant Fordham was one, his radio operator was another. Those rounds had been adjusted and they landed right behind the helicopter. It was awful. I hadn't shaved in a month. I had a mustache all the time. Some guys had beards. I hadn't had a haircut in four months. We checked in and the first sergeant looks at us and he said, what are you doing here? You don't even look like Marines. Go get a haircut, shave. Captain Sneed came over. He said, we're getting a real FO in the morning. That's how we put it. We're getting a real FO. Like I wasn't the FO? No. <laughs> okay. And I said, am I going to stay and be the scout? And he said, no, you're getting out of the field. I'm going home. I'm going home. In the morning, the guy came off the helicopter. I handed him the binoculars and the maps I had. We flew out on a continental jet again. And this time, it didn't stop in the middle of the Pacific because it could fly all the way to El Toro. And then we landed. And we came down the ramp, and there were kids, younger, I say kids, younger Marines sitting under those palm trees at the picnic tables. So that was me a year ago. I'm so thankful I'm here. When I got home, my mother opened the door, took a step backwards, and almost fainted. On top of the TV console were two little four-inch square televisions. I haven't been home five minutes, and I said, what's with the TVs? She said, it's your father. Every night at 6.30, he watches the news, ABC, NBC, and CBS, without fail. He watched it every day. He came in at 5 o'clock, 5.30, when I stood up. 
He said, how long have you been home? I said, oh, I got in this morning. God damn it! You didn't call me? You didn't come see me? It's like I could never please him, you know? I flunked out of his college, and now I didn't go see him. And in retrospect, I've got kids of my own. It was a bad way to treat my father. I can think of three specific moments when I should have died. If the round had been 12 inches to the right or to the left, a mortar shell landed literally 12 inches away from the hole I was in. Ba-boom, 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 and then boom, one hit right on our stove, right in front of it. I mean, I could have died, you know, in my first, that would have been my first real month in Vietnam. So I would say lucky. In my downtime, in the siege, at any other time in Vietnam, I wrote. I have an ability to communicate. And I wrote a lot of letters, and I, people sent me tons of letters. I had people writing letters all the time. And I start this letter by, mother fuck. <laughs> I don't know. Here's a drawing of our bunker. We slept on cardboard for a long time, but eventually we got two cots. That's the bunker. Joe Doherty was my best friend from high school. We've known each other since eighth grade, still friends today. He saved every letter that I wrote, and there's at least 100, 125 letters. The siege had been underway for 10 days. The Tet Offensive has just started, and I really thought I was gonna get killed up there, and I wrote this letter to him. And it was a farewell letter that I wrote to my parents and my brothers and sister. I said to Joe, when I get killed, I want you to bring this to their house at some point. I felt I needed to say goodbye to them because I didn't leave on great terms. I wrote it, put it in the envelope, and I put a note on the outside. I said, Joe, I want you to bring this to their house. So this is the fin assembly. This is what's left of an 82 mortar. And so when it goes up, turns, and comes down, when it hits there and it blows up, all the shrapnel goes in every direction, and some of it goes up. I don't know if I can do this or it works for you. You want to turn the lights off or that would, can you see that? Every big hole or every big tear that you see in that towel means you're dead. And every little piece means surgery at some point or removal of shrapnel. I think shrapnel is the greatest cause of injury and death to soldiers on battlefields. You think about that day, huh, when you look at that towel? I do, how close it could have been right away. I'd have been one of the new guys that got hit, killed the first 30 days. Yeah. It is pretty humbling to see it and understand that how close I came. I didn't want to go back to Vietnam and to Khe Sanh, stand there like I did in, in September of 67 and look up and say, oh, there's 861. I didn't want that experience. If I couldn't go on the hill, I never would have gone. And when I knew I was gonna go, and I grabbed a whole fistful of plus palm, and I wrote 28 names in the day they died, and my plan was to read them up there when we were all up there. Thirty-three years you've been whining. Here the here's Dong Three right here from 950. So if you kind of put the map. Just like that, right? There's 950 and 10, all right? 1015 to the right. right. I didn't go like this. Go like this. Down through there. Great. Great. Looking for you. <laughs> you looking for me. <laughs> I've been waiting 32 years for this day. I wanted to go at 861, stand on that hill, because I wanted to pay tribute to the friends and Marines who died up there. Because you never get a chance to say goodbye when they get killed. You don't have time. You have a job to do and you have to keep on going. We hired a van. We had a driver. Went up to Quezon. We walked around the combat base. A night later, we packed up. We made our way up. It was wet and kind of rainy. And we got to a point where we got onto a small ridge line. It was clearly a clearing. We weren't uphill, we were flat, and everybody stopped to rest. And all of a sudden, I realized there were holes in the ground. 
We're in a Marine Corps position here, fellas. Really? American fucking camp right here. Plastic bags from the Sea Rats, 33 years ago. Probably hill fights. Spring, 67. Right here, baby. Look at this. Still, underneath it's still good. You can read the writing. There have been foxholes probably dug during the hill fights. Start digging down in them, and you found sea ration spoons. It was incredible to think we were standing right here. Are these uh, this the dead? Elk. I found my bunker. No, they're not dead. I know, right, I'm standing, my pack is where my bunker was. No, this is not, that they're live. <laughs> Don't kick them. It seems so goddamn small. So contained like that. It's your memory and your imagination that makes it bigger than it really was. I mean, it, it doesn't diminish what happened up there. And I might thought, well, how could all this shit happen in, a, in an area like this size? But it did. We made it. The, the hills yeah. are the same. I, I swear to God, they're the same. Well, there's that tree line I was trying to hit. Right. You know, that night. Right. And then we put a big, and then there's the ridge line right over there that right. led up to the forest. There's no, the forest has grown back now. I see the guy got shot in the eye and killed there from uh, that platoon that went out. There's the ridge line right over there. And look at all the bomb camps. Yeah, all the sugar. That little 50 caliber position right, is right in, in here somewhere. That we, when you see my bunker over here, you'll recognize it. You right. will recognize that. All I can hear are birds chirping. And there's no more rain. It stopped raining. It was just mist blowing in over the ridge line. You could see this dip down and come back out. It was really eerie. I said an Our Father and a Hail Mary out loud. And then I randomly pulled the names out of the bag. I read their name the day they died. I said, rest in peace. And then I let it go into the wind. And then I walked back down the hill. Now I'm on the LZ looking up towards the top. When I looked up and I saw eight, 10, figures standing in the mist up there. Some had ponchos on, some had their helmets on. They weren't in a formation, they were just standing in kind of a loose group. The wind was moving their clothing and the ponchos. They weren't saying anything, they just were looking and I, I really blinked and looked away thinking this is not possible. Maybe I'm just imagining this and I looked again and they were still standing there. So I saluted one time, I'm not much for formalities, but I saluted one time turned and walked back off the hill and never looked back over the LZ and all the way down. We we're coming a little further back towards 861 and there was a foxhole there. Um, had obviously been weathered. And then I fished around at the bottom and there was a locket there. I kind of opened it up a little bit. There was a picture inside of a little girl and a woman. And I thought, God damn, that's when I knew the foxhole was a Vietnamese foxhole. This was a North Vietnamese soldier who died there. That is the tragedy, that for every veteran that's out there, there's family behind. And, and as heartbroken as that people feel about someone dying next to them, back home, people are, are feeling even worse, you know. Uh, it's an unforgiving business. We keep doing it though, I guess. And if you could use one word to describe that whole experience, what would it be? Grateful for having the life that I've lived since then. I've lived a very charmed and lucky life. You know, I have four kids, we've got 11 grandkids. Um, I, I feel really, really lucky. My dad smoked from the time he was 14, Chesterfield Kings, never quit. They took out a lung, he kept smoking. So in the process of dying of lung cancer and emphysema, he was in the hospital and we talked about Vietnam. And he said, the reason I was so angry and disappointed was that as FBI agents, we knew the way the war was being run, there was no way they could win it. It's just, that's what he thought. That's what the FBI thought. The way it was being run, they couldn't win it. And he said, it tore me up inside and made me so angry, but also afraid that my oldest son would voluntarily put himself in a place of harm like that. He said, that's why I said all the things and didn't say anything in all those months, years back, you know. 
And I said, Dad, I understand, you know, I understand. That was the only time we ever talked about it, but he, he, he knew, they knew. War is a bad business. And whether you're wounded physically, everybody gets wounded emotionally, psychologically. You can't escape that. It may end, the war they're in, the conflict they're in may end, but the battle inside, the mind and the brain goes on forever. 90% of my life is in my rear view mirror. It's only 10% left and I want to make the best out of my 10%.